Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dhanapani, I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Today we're going to discuss a pretty interesting topic is reuse the new recycling. We have Emma Burlow, who is uh, one of UK's leading specialists in circular economy and sustainability in business, who will moderate this webinar. She's moderated other webinars on Be Waste Wise, which you will find on the video panel section of our website. Emma is also the founder of Lighthouse Sustainability. Today, she will talk to Alvin Lear, who's the CEO and co-founder at Pakorang, and Dan Wright, co-founder at CanCan. We have received the questions that came in along with your registrations, and they have been incorporated. Uh, in, they will be included in today's conversation. If you have any other questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section. And stay alert. We also have a few polls for you. Over to you, Emma. Thanks ever so much. It's great to be back moderating for Be Waste Wise. Um, and thank you um, so much to Dan and Alvin for joining me. Um, I'm really lucky to be able to work with startups um, like, like Can Can and Packerang, who we're going to hear from today um, in my work. So I just wanted to spread the word a bit about reuse today um, and talk about how we're all starting to adapt and adjust to a new world of sharing economy. Um, and reuse as part of the circular economy. So really the objective of today is to try and, as I said, share some information with you, uh, dig a bit deeper into reuse models and to sort of explore what it's like to be a startup in this space. Um, and really encourage all of you out there to, uh, to, to explore your own reuse models. So they're not without their challenges. So hopefully we're gonna cover some of that today. So I think we'll kick off by trying to find out kind of what you, understand or what you believe at this point in time. We all know a lot about recycling, we've lived with it for many years, but do we all know enough about reuse? So, Sweeta, are you going to put up the first poll? Do you believe recycling is the answer to reducing the impact of single-use packaging? So we've got four options really just trying to gauge where you are on this kind of spectrum of all the single use, um, all the circular economy business models, the, all the options that we are all starting to hear about. And we know we've got a particular issue with single use packaging, so that's why I've honed in on that. So we've got about 50 people joining us, that's great. Thanks very much. So the results are in. So pretty resounding. We need to look at other ways to reduce the impact such as reuse. Right, I guess that's why you're all here. <laughs> um, slightly lower is that recycling perpetuates the, perpetuates overconsumption. So this is a broader, uh, broader issue. It should be a lower priority. Well, if we look at the waste hierarchy, which most people will be familiar with, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, and that it says, you know, it speaks for itself really, that we should be looking at slowing the flow, using resources for longer, keeping them in play for longer, and recycling at them at the end of life. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is about the use phase of a product and extending that from a very short use phase, something like a single use piece of cutlery or a cup or a, uh, an envelope, and extending that use phase and obviously considering its end of life as well. Okay, so over to my panel. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dan Wright from Can Can, based in the UK, and Alvin Lear from Pakarang, based in Norway. Um, so I'm not gonna do big introductions. You guys can look on, on the respective websites if you wanna know more about the company, but hopefully through the questions today in the panel, we'll get to explore in quite a lot of depth around um, how these businesses have evolved and the kind of market it, markets they're looking to serve. So I'll kick off with a sort of general question. Why run a reuse business, not a recycling business? Alvin, do you wanna kick off? Why did you start a reuse business? I think recycling has been tried and tested for decades um, and, and we haven't, 
we haven't seen that recycling has been sort of the answer to the wider issue of, of uh, waste generation. Um, we haven't seen the numbers stack up to even, even what we had hoped they, they would. Um, so for me, that was never even a question. Um, I, I, I sort of looked past recycling and I, I, I sort of a sort of a failed attempt almost. Uh, and and uh, yes, it works in, in certain regions and certain applications, but as a, as a wider um, concept, recycling isn't, one, it isn't the answer, uh, I think we can, we can say, and then two, it isn't even as sufficient as we maybe uh, a lot of us think it is. Um, so, so yeah, for, for, for me, that was quite natural. Uh, and we, we kind of skipped past that and wanted to, to focus on reuse. Aiming higher, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. I, you know, I think we, none of us would deny that recycling has its place um, because it's an, you know, a, a way of uh, keeping resources at a value, but we have been at it a very long time. Um, you know, we've had potential to recycle from since the fifties. So yeah, really interesting. I, I, you know, you're an innovative company, so you're obviously aiming high. Dan, why did you start a reusables business? I, yeah, so I I have first expe first hand experience of recycling with my my other business that I've been running for over twenty years. It's a, it's a business that designs, manufactures, and supplies retailers all over the world with plastic shoe hangers. They're made from one hundred percent recycled plastic. We manufacture them as ethically as we possibly can. Uh, they get collected by the, the retailers uh, at the end of their, uh, their journey, um, but only by the retailers that, uh, are, that want to do that. And a lot of that comes down to, well, a, a complex set of you know, um, reasons, but ultimately it's a commercial decision or has been a commercial decision whether these hangers get re actually get recycled at the end of the life. And, and a lot of that comes, boils down to, is there enough value in the recycling to get to make them recycled? And if it's not commercially viable, then they don't. And I guess I've been very frustrated over the years not having the control of what happens to the products that I'm manufacturing that I want to get recycled, but I don't always, depending on the ethics of that retailer. Great, I think we've just about summed it up and that's maybe why we haven't reached the recycling rates that we all would like to see. And it's really frustrating when we see how low recycling rates are and you've just touched on you know, part of the problem there. And a lot of recycling is actually downcycling isn't it? Depending on the material, depending on how contaminated it is. So you're on a sort of downward spiral there. And obviously the circular economy is about keeping things uh, at a higher value as you can. That's great. So on to, you know, my next thought then is sort of how do you help people understand that point? And maybe we'll flip now onto your consumers and tell us a bit more about your products. How do you help people understand that reuse is preferable to recycling because we've all got used to recycling. So how do we make this next step? Dan, do you want to pick off with that one? Okay, so just to give a bit of background, I'm mm, um, co-founder of CanCan, uh, -Can, and CanCan -Can is a is a is a platform and it has an app. And currently, we're piloting in Bristol uh, our app, which allows allows consumers to borrow and return reusables without leaving a deposit. And our pilot is all about trying to make reuse as easy as possible. And uh, so to answer your question, um, so something that's come up recently was just this question, how can we help mm. people understand, mm. you know, that it's preferable and, um, so one of the cafes that we're working with, so they produce on average around 1,800 single use throwaway uh, coffee cups in a week. And um, so the, yes, these are compostable, but 
they know, we know that that all just gets thrown away. And if it's collected in Bristol, then that gets incinerated in a waste to energy plant. Um, so one of our uh, plans for our pilot going forward, when we introduce some ambassadors at each site will be to show a big large sack of 1,800 cups. And against that, uh, the number of cups that if they went round and round the system would actually be the equivalent of that 1,800 cups. And um, so theoretically, you, so our target is to use our cups uh, 40 times. So if we had an average reuse rate of 40, then you would only actually need 45 cups to go around the system uh, to be that equivalent. In reality, you would need a large pool of stock. Mm. So depending on how often you were washing those items, mm. so realistic, you probably need about 500 cups in, in your system. But being able to show that visually, I think will be really powerful. And so, yeah, that, that's yeah, my that's great. Example. Yeah, I think you're right. You've hit the nail on the head with the, with the visuals. I often say, I think the person who invented the black bin bag has got a lot to answer for. You know, and as soon as we put recyclables in a bin, we kind of hope that someone takes care of it. But you know that particularly with things like food, they're gonna get contaminated. And, you know, it's really unlikely that they're going to get recycled. So, I mean, just, just just to add to that, mm. uh, we because because we were discussing this also, um, we feel it's it's got to be tangible. Just showing, uh, you know, a landfill site with mountains of cups, it doesn't mean anything to people. But if they can see that by you know their action of buying a cup of coffee every day in their local cafe is adding to this problem then it's tangible and if then there's a, a solution to overcome that then surely that's that's the that's the next step mm, i really like the idea of localizing that so that is those cups from that coffee shop like you say it's not a random landfill or an ocean or a beach somewhere else yeah the connection is really important yeah no no kind of let's not do the doom and gloom and try and scare people into it let's just look at the facts and and act on that great love that yeah great Alvin do you want to come in and tell us a little bit about your product and how you're how you are um, helping people understand reuse Absolutely. versus the recycling message yeah um we're similar to Dan we, we have a maybe not localizing uh our, our marketing but um we're personalizing it so just to give the background as well from from our perspective yeah, so okay. uh co-founder of Packerang, which is a um, platform uh mobile app and and uh and also uh, a product, which is a reusable uh, mailer bag. Um, so it's, it's highly durable um, and, and very flexible. So it's basically designed to uh, basically replace parcels um, as, as a whole. That, that's our, our end goal is to have um, very few parcels uh, out there in the e-commerce world and to have reusable uh, options instead. Um, so we've built out the, the platform to enable that in terms of return systems, et cetera. And uh, we have a mobile app as well towards um, end consumers. So I think uh, in terms of how you, how you market it and how you make uh, end consumers understand, I, I think uh, Dan touched upon the, the local. We're, we're doing something similar. We're, you know, we're basically right now working with the film team actually uh, to, to show um, the average person's uh, e-commerce trash that, that they generate, right? Just just showing what, what does the average person shopping online generate in terms of trash per year. And it's actually, it's quite surprising. Uh, and, it, and it's a very visual image. Um, and it makes you, you know, not, not, not to single anybody out or, or, or make people feel bad, but it's, it's basically highlighting the fact that there's a better way and, and we need to go and get all on board with this this better uh, system now um, which, which both uh, can can and, and, and pack rank represent um, it's all in the data showing the facts and saying here here is a better way um, and we need to act and we need to do it now that's great that's great I mean you've both given a really good um, argument there for making this very personal and maybe that's 
kind of how we got to this point. Waste was very, uh, it was not, you know, we weren't connected with our impact. So I think we're starting to see that around carbon footprinting, aren't we, as well? Your, what's your personal carbon footprint and what's your, you know, what's your personal connection to it? So that's, that's really interesting to see. And so we're in a pandemic and we're all still seeing the effects of that. Now, you'll know that reuse has been affected by that as much as lots of other things have done, not least in hospitality, but also in, in, in your sector, Alvin, in e-commerce in terms of, um, you know, fears over hygiene and that sort of thing. So how do you see re reuse evolving in the coming months? So let's say post COVID, we're, we're pulling out of this now. Are we gonna revert back to recycling? Are we gonna stick with disposables or how do you see you know, re reuse evolving? Alvin, do you want to head on to that one? I think um, I think the COVID period has been just basically igniting uh, what's already been there in terms of trends. It's, it's make, made things a little bit faster and, and uh, the, the change is happening really, really quickly now. And I think it's highlighting a problem that already was there in the back of our minds and it's put, put it a little bit more top of mind in terms of you know the e-commerce sector exploding and, and, and even more gen uh, trash generated uh, annually right now than than ever before. I think it's it's put a high a very welcome highlight on on the issue. Um, I think in the coming years uh, and even months, uh, it's it's going to be an extremely rapid change into reusable. Um, we, we're seeing trends, and we talk to stakeholders uh, for anything from restaurant chains to to e-commerce, uh, you know, you, anything from uh, your 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 um, Fedora to your your uh, uh, Patagonia, you know, that they, they're all working extremely hard on 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 circular models right now, and 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 these are trendsetters, these these bigger companies, and and we talk to them on a, on a weekly basis, and I I don't think we can uh, overestimate how fast things are going to change right now um, in, in the next two to three years. It's it's going to be a more of a system, more and more commonplace to to reuse. You're you're automatically going to get a product in your in your hand, and you're automatically going to think, you know, is is this reusable or single use? Um, and and more and more likely in the coming years, it's going to be more reused than than single use. Um, at least that's that's my prediction based on the market that I'm seeing. Great, yeah. And wouldn't that be great if we could raise the public awareness to a point where you know, people are starting to question the sustainability of things. And that's been proven through customer surveys and that sort of thing that, you know, people want this information. And we've just started seeing eco labels and, you know, those sorts of things. So wouldn't that be great if you were to, you know, instantly recognize something as reusable or, or not? I think we've got to get into the, like say, the public psyche. Um, Absolutely. And I think the, the, the more, more circular offerings uh, on the market, the more you're going to question why, why isn't everything like this? What what is yeah. the issue here? And it's going to be uh, more of a awareness in, in the public um, automatically. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. I firmly believe we're evolving out of a single use age. You know, we're we've we you know we've we've kind of been there 50s, 60s, 70s, and then it kind of exploded, and now we're sort of you know the bubbles almost burst. That's that's sort of how I feel, and it's time to regroup. And we'll come on to the tech that both of you are using in your businesses, but I think that's going to be a key. A key facilitator we couldn't have done that in the you know uh, 30 years ago um even 10 Absolutely. years ago yeah so dan you're you're working your, in hospitality so covid must have been an interesting time for for your product and your business what do you think uh, how do you see it evolving in the coming months and how do you tackle that so right now we're experiencing a lot of interest in what we're doing however you know the the fact is is that hospitality is 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 really struggling um, because there's so much uncertainty and um, and so you know the uh, yes the, um, the the you know the take up is strong but it it it's still a niche market for us at the moment and we we firmly got our sights sent on set on. Uh, scaling this, um, it, you know, to a, a national solution, uh, and really to do that, the 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 legislation that is set to come into Europe could really do with coming into into the UK uh, at the same time. Um, you know, that that would be really nice. Uh, the the other thing to add is that 
you know, consumers have had a pretty rough ride as well. You know, they were, you know, they, they were told that, you know, told to recycle. And, um, and then in the press, we had all these stories of, you know, their recycling ended up on beaches in, you know, Indonesia and Malaysia and, you know, all sorts of horror stories, which is a real shame because it's, it's created mistrust. So I think all reusable businesses have got uh, a big job to, to build that trust again with consumers. But, you know, not only this is the right way, but if we say that we're going to reuse something, we actually do, and we can prove that. Um, and we can come on to this, I'm sure, in a bit. But, mm -hmm. you know, having the, the evidence, having an evidence-based system whereby you, you can prove how many times an item has been reused around the system um, and you're not just guessing and greenwashing is, is really uh, at the core of, should be at the core of any reused business. Right, so, so I think what I'm hearing there, Dan, is in order to give consumers and traders, if you like, users confidence, we can use this, you know, the tracking um system to you know give real-time data does are you able to do that absolutely that's at the core of our solution it's much harder to do that but we from the outset we could re we could see that if you unless you you do it and you've got an end-to-end -end secure system then all the other benefits that come from that you know can't be realized Great, yeah. And Alvin, have you, you've obviously worked on the tech behind your app as well. How important is that for you in terms of the, uh, the B2B offer and also the B2C offer? I think it, it's make it or break it. I, I think it's, uh, it's absolutely crucial, um, particularly for the, the, the end consumer segment. Um, you need incentives in place. You need to have it so streamlined and so user friendly and so easy to do people are, are incredibly spoiled uh you know we all are uh these days with with incredible experiences you, you even have experiences uh coming to your door when you buy a uh, certain products you the, the, just that user experience is just everywhere um and and it needs it's expected to be everywhere also in the future for for innovative uh, um, concepts like like circular uh, um, projects um so, so our tech is very much focused on, um, on, on the user experience, uh, making it as easy as possible to return, make it as easy as possible to communicate and see the, 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 the difference you're, you're, you're making in, 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 in this world, basically, um, mm. and, and, and receiving incentives, et cetera. So it's um, extremely important. Um, and also the data, of course, very, very important. So we, we have a chip in each, each of our, our reusable bags, um, and that's just, just to gather data on circularity and, and uh, how many reuses um, we get average per bag, per sector, uh, per product, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot of valuable data there that we can gather and, and even help circularity uh, as, as a whole here. Um, mm. and that's our end goal here. Yeah, because we have to learn about behaviors, don't we? So, you know, one of the um, rubs I often see is people, you know, people saying, well, people are lazy. They're not going to adopt this new, you know, they're just not going to do it. They want the most convenient um, solution. Um, so I think by learning about what people's patterns of behavior are, you know, we're better placed, aren't we, to understand how far they'll walk to a bin, how long they, you know, they want to keep that parcel for. Um, are they willing to drop it off? How much of an incentive do they need? Exactly. So there's a lot of, it's a lot of information in there. It is, and, and and the more information, the more the more uh, critical you need to be with curation, um, and and that that doesn't only go for for what we're doing, it goes for for everything online. We're we're bombarded these days, and it, it decentivized. Um, um, so so it's yeah, no, it's um it's very very important to us, and I think if you don't have that approach, um, I think you can almost forget about it. I, it's, it's it's that simple. Um, mm, really interesting. So what I'm seeing is we're moving on from. You know, reuse has always been there. We've reused our coffee cups if we own one. We've all used our shopping bags. But the uh, the prevalence, if you like, the mainstream uh, hasn't adopted that. 
so the use has always been small and I you know lucky to get sort of five or ten percent so what needs to happen then on top of the things you've just said you know you're what you're doing as businesses but maybe more structurally and there was a question here from Joanna about you know can this change be driven by industry um, or does government are we waiting for government legislation and what needs to happen to accelerate the take-up of reuse so that it becomes the dominant model hmm. and, and Alvin I know you're working across several countries so maybe you can give us a perspective of yeah um you know, I can jump in there um, different places. yeah no it's um very interesting to see the different different corporations but also different um governments and, and different markets um act differently and, and be at completely different stages um there's just sust sustainability debt in certain countries that are is, is tremendous already and it's, it's just going to likely increase in, in the coming years and and that's a, it's a big risk for uh for countries actually not not just companies um so i i think you, you need to jump on the train right now and i think a lot of companies are and countries and governments are are seeing that now there is a little bit more desperation in, in terms of what do we do uh, beyond beyond the, the the simple document the state's carbon neutrality by this and that date um, there there's a bit more of a scramble now to to in terms of legis legislation in terms of um, tax relief etc so uh, we, we've seen that in Nor Norway's been sort of a, on the forefront in terms of getting uh, electric vehicles uh, to to sort of be the mainstream, um, you know, tiny, tiny country and, and being being Tesla's biggest customer um, for, for many years uh, with five million people. So it's I, I think and that that was all spurred on by tons of incentives stacked on, on top of each other um, by the Norwegian government uh, with being able to use the bus and taxi lanes, uh, avoiding queues, uh, and free charging uh, many places, et cetera. So. Uh, no, no tolls, customs, uh, you know, many, many uh, incentives. So I, I think that's that's going to accelerate. I think in every sector now. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So I suppose a, a sub question is that you know, are you waiting for the legislation? Do you need to wait no. for the legislation? No, I, I think we need to put the pressure. I, I think the pressure needs to come from uh, below. Um, but the real acceleration potentially could come when when it also comes pressure from above and incentives. Um, because so it could, we be are double whammy. could be a double whammy. Exactly. I, I think you. I think you need that to to reach uh, critical mass, basically. Yeah. And Dan, what about you? Um, we've seen reuse, particularly in hospitality, bubbling around at the sort of five, ten percent, you know, level. Even with twenty five p incentives and all sorts of things, you know, Pret and others have tried it. What needs to happen? Do you think? um for sort of take this to the next level to accelerate this uh, transition to reuse so so our starting point was identifying uh traders who have got uh that were value aligned with what we were trying to do uh, so during our pilot we're now building a uh a, a group of consumers uh aligned to those traders and and really this this is our strategy to to to, to launch um off the back of our pilot and that is to start with a group of start start with the start in the community with consumers that believe in what you're you're doing are they become your ambassadors and and then and then we can we can then make some noise about what we're doing and attract other communities that are looking for solutions to the problem. So our yeah, I suppose our, our, our growth strategy is to grow community by community, working with local business and people that are engaged in and want to solve the problem. Um, you know, we are talking to larger businesses as well but i think that they're watching what's happening in in the independence market and in the community in terms of uh, and when legislation is going to come before they make that leap oh, um, that's really interesting so you think they're yeah the mainstream if you like are watching all these you know ideas starting to bubble up 
um, from the independent sector. Um, yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, that's that's how these things come about, isn't it? It's often it's often the way someone has a great idea on a small scale, and then I'm just I mean, interested. There, there, in there are a, there are a few exceptions. Mm. Um, you know, Starbucks have got you know really fantastic, uh, some really great plans in place in Europe and in North America. Um, but um, but yeah, we're we're all about community. Mm. Mm. Um, and identifying communities because actually if you can keep it local people can they can see the benefits more clearly yeah yeah no that's great so just staying um on the product then and if we sort of whiz to end of life there's a question here from joanna um dan um people are interested in actually in the materials that are in both of these products um, so what is the end of life process for, for a can-can cup or container? We should say it's cups and food containers, isn't it? So it could be a takeaway bowl or a box. Um, and do you know the carbon impact of your reusable system versus, you know, the traditional? Is that something you've worked on? Yeah, so, so this is our eight ounce coffee cup. Uh, I'll just mention that we don't manufacture any of our own products. We partner with some fantastic companies who are creating, uh, and it's an ever-changing market in terms of development of, you know, high-tech reusables. So this reusable, uh, it's uh, it's it's one hundred percent polypropylene. Um, it's it's um, it weighs around fourteen grams, so it's only a couple of grams more than a traditional disposable cup. And they achieve that by foaming the wall of the cup. And then this allows it to have really good insulation properties. So, so you're actually, it's actually an upgrade for the consumer experience because they, they don't burn their hand and they know they're drinking out something that isn't ultimately going to get thrown away, you know, a matter of minutes later. Uh, so in terms of the, the cycles, so our target is 40 cycles. And then at the end of that life, we can we can take we can track and the system will tell us when we're when we need to check certain items and take them out of the system uh, or if they get damaged, we can take them out. Um, the because the cup is 100 percent one material. So that now can be recycled into something else. Um, in terms of putting it back into another cup. So what we need here is food grade polypropylene recycling in the mainstream. And there are a number of companies uh, that we know of in the UK who are, who are working towards having uh, a mainstream solution for this, but that isn't available yet. However, we are working with our manufacturer to make sure that this product will be, it'll be ready to be recycle back to food grade which means that that material can be put back into the manufacture of new cups and hence closing the whole loop and it's really important to us that whatever products we work with we have got the best closing of the loop as we mm. possibly can mm -hmm. and i think what's nice about that dan is because you have control of the asset so you haven't sold that asset to a consumer and then you've got to somehow get it out of its bin, their bin. Yeah, exactly. Um, We're not leaving happens. it to somebody else to yeah, make to that somebody. decision. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that makes, means you know exactly where those materials were made, what their value is, you know, how many. Again, it comes back to this data. I think what we've seen with recycling is it's a bit of a kind of um, throw it out there and hope for the best, you know, and we've got curbside, but that you know that's not foolproof um so we need to start be looking at these kind of more of these return systems that you're talking mm. about which keep the material um in play for longer and then obviously in a controlled environment it's not it's much less likely to leak out um so, so for, for a, a consumer that signs up to this scheme the the value of the cup to the consumer is whatever we set that time-based penalty at. If they if they don't return the cup within five days, then there is a they're, they're charged a penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So although there might only be pence worth of material in the cup itself, from a recycling point of view, because we've we've we put a, a we created a value on the cup, mm. which is pounds and not pence, then we, 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 we've added value to keep the cup in the system. Mm, that's really interesting. So this word value keeps coming up, doesn't it? And I think um, we'll come back to carbon just so everyone's aware. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pass on that, but Alvin, has mm. this issue of value been important to you? Because obviously um, e-commerce packaging is essentially a disposable item, right? So it has literally no value to the consumer. Mm. So, yeah, you for, for the cons- how you get them to value that packaging a bit more. I mean, what happens yeah. if Packer and Mailer gets thrown in the bin? You know? Yeah, that's that's been a, in our minds since since we started designing it because there there's been some reusable packaging companies trying and testing the water for for, for just a few years now. Um, there's been two issues. One is the fact that it hasn't been rewarding enough or easy enough to return it, um, and two is the fact that uh, many of the products haven't been appearing to be reusable they, they almost look as if they are designed for for disposal um, so they look a bit too similar in my 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 view anyway to to single use um, that's you know it's not what you want to receive if you, if you receive something that you you, you need that perceived value uh, when you receive a reusable uh, item um, you need to see clearly that it's reusable and and, and you will treated differently uh you certainly will um and, and of course you, you'll avoid mistakes as well uh, you know you're not going to mistake it for uh, a single use because a lot of people don't read messages on on anything these days there's just because of the bombardment um so 800 to 1200 uh, ads per day uh, we're up to now uh so so you know people don't necessarily read everything that you write um regardless of, of the message um mm. so yeah that perceived value is very interesting so it needs to be almost a subconscious message, you know, and exactly. both of you are w- working to make, you know, the reuse message, the subconscious, like the default option. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and you mentioned with, with single you or with recycling that you, you kind of hope for the best, uh, you, you, you put it to the side, hope for the best. And that, that's, that's sort of a, an issue of the past, uh, I think of the past, because, you know, with reusable, uh, which are higher va- value, but you can split the, the costs based on number of uses, right? So mm. um, you can actually afford that technology to say, hey, this, this item has an actual ID. You can actually track back that it's been reused X amount of times. So it's, it's a bit more of a trust as well with the consumer, I think. Yeah, great. Okay, so just on that tracking, the question I'm just going to pick up from Joshua Young, how is each item uniquely identified throughout the system? So if you'd both just give me a quick rundown on, on how that tech works sure i'll, I'll start since i have the word uh, and yeah. um yeah our we 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 landed on a unique rfid slash nfc chip so it's a tiny chip in each bag um that's readable not only at and on mass with with uh, in terms of rfid scanners which which uh, brings down cost on our, on our logistical end uh but also for the consumer to be able to interact with the bag with NFC, so actually uh, our, our mobile app is built so that it you basically hold the app against the bag, uh, the NFC mark, um, and, and that's that's basically it. Um, so it has a unique uh, ID or personality, if you will. Right, and Dan, what what uh, what tech are you using to to give each cup or bowl a unique personality? Yeah, so we 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 started off looking uh, testing. NFC and RFID chips, but the the um, the only thing with our items is is uh, getting that that uh, that chip onto the item uh, and attaching it and keeping it on there through washing. So we we changed tack uh, and we now use a QR code. Uh, and the other benefit of a QR code is it's 100% recyclable. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to remove that the, 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 that chip in the recycling process. So is that printed on, Dan? So it is for so for our pilot, we're using a sticker, a mm. waterproof sticker. Um, and but for our for our scaling, it'll be digitally printed onto the cup directly. 
uh, which Great. will give it a, a much longer life. Brilliant. Okay, that's been fascinating. Um, I think I'm going to go straight over to the next poll and then there's so many questions coming in. I'm just going to ditch my questions, guys, and still go to the Q&A because there's so many good questions. But uh, Swita, could you do the honours with the next poll and we'll get everybody answering? So we've heard about two great reuse uh, systems that are ploughing ahead to make reuse mainstream. But what are your concerns? What concerns Sorry about my typing. What concerns do you have about using reusable service such as CanCan or Packerang? I'm not sure if you can ch choose more than one, but go for your top one. Oh, just gone off my screen. All right, so I will end the poll now. Thank you. Great, okay. So our learned audience have uh, given us their answers and they feel, about a third of them feel that convenience is the most important thing. And behind that is cost. And actually very interestingly, a quarter of people here today have no concerns and just want to get on with it. So that's great. So cost and convenience, I suppose no major surprises there. Any any comments from, from either of you, Dan or Alvin, on, on those two? I mean, I guess those are the things that, that you know when you're building your business models, but how are you getting around those kind of concerns? I think convenience uh, is not surprising to me. Uh, it, it's We did some polls on that and, and saw the same. Convenience was the number one. Um, we from end consumers anyway uh, of course as, as a b2b to c which we are we, we sell to brands uh, that then you know make available our products to end consumers for for in, in their checkouts right so uh, for for the businesses that ship products of course security will, will be a lot higher uh, but for end consumers convenience tends to be very high up there cost sometimes um so so yeah not not too 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 surprised and convenience is you have to make it easy um, in this day and age. You, you're just you, you're mm. spoiled for choices right now. Um, mm. so you, yeah, we can't we can't neglect uh, putting us front front and center in terms of the UX and mm. the user experience. Yeah, great. And what have you done in terms of your returns process to design that to be as convenient as possible? So I, I presume that's the point most people are concerned about. I get this right. parcel through. What do I do with it? Yeah. Sure. So yeah. So we uh, we have two two systems we're working on. We're uh, building out system one right now, which is letting consumers integrate this return into their lives. Um, you know, if they go to the gas station or petrol station, if they go to the grocery store, uh, or 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 to pick up a parcel in a parcel locker or a postal office, they they need to be able to to hand off their empty packaging right there and then, um, integrating into their lifestyle um, and and. Part B, which is uh, where we're building out as, as well in the background, is actually to integrate it with postal services uh, that come to your door, or even any any services, even flower florists or, or anything, anything that comes to your door will um, will be carried there by by somebody who should be able to take it back. Great. So it's all about integration. Correct. Yeah. Any thoughts, Dan, on on your kind of focus on how do we make this as convenient as possible? Because obviously single use is pretty convenient. How do we uh, how do we make reuse the next single use? So so the, the 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 first part of the journey for the consumer is downloading the app and signing up. So we've made this as quick and easy as possible uh, to minimise any barriers when they go to order their coffee and collect it again it's 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 as seamless as possible and you know we we've, we've we've got a really really slick system and um, the traders and consumers find that no problem i think in terms of the returns which is uh, is the, the 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 key concern in terms of any reuse system we we we're just at the start of our journey really we're we're, we're piloting in a community where 
we you know we're, we're, we're building our networks around it, within a city within uh you know traders that are very closely located and and users that are are, are not taking huge journeys it's all very local in in terms of to, to to scale that and make it mainstream we will we know that we will need infrastructure and and really that that is uh that that is the next stage mm. in our in our growth to provide that convenience but i think that businesses can play a part here because it may be that if the business invested in a, a drop-off point within their office, uh, then you know the, the, the daily habits of, uh, of, of a, an office worker uh, could be made more convenient. So I think it's just it's just looking and learning mm. from, from our pilot to, to see how we step by step we can just increase that convenience. Yeah, definitely. And like you've said, the collaboration is really important but it all starts to kind of feed in doesn't it because the general messages i'm getting is everyone's keen to find a solution okay so uh, you know they, they it's not like there's kind of like oh no 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 don't come talk to me about that you know the doors are open and, and haven't never been so open um just picking up a question that's come in and then two things here one is we've just talked about this scale up and dan you've touched on the fact that we're going to need some infrastructure but Equally, this other issue about cost, how do we help overcome the initial setup costs um, in either of your sectors? You know, what are the setup costs like? And are you seeing that as a barrier? So Dan, do you want to talk about that in hospitality, the setup costs for moving to reuse? So, so is that in terms of for the trader or for Yeah, the for the trader, because your system is free to use, is it? For the consumer so what's the setup cost for the trader so the the setup cost for the trader is is a an android phone and um depending on their um their throughput uh, an external scanner um and then in terms of the the return point it's simply a, a box uh at, at the simplistic level or it's a secure box or it's a smart box without mm. going into any more detail. Yeah, okay, yeah. I think what something that I'd like to just hone in on here is the the so that so the more drop-off points you have for somebody for reuse will should equal more convenience. Mm. Um, if if those drop-off points are really expensive to manufacture and have all the bells and whistles on them, great, but but that won't provide um if, if you have one of those compared to 10 low tech or no tech drop off points uh you know that it's not going to provide as much um convenience and you know we've we've learned this from the return deposit uh solution the, the drs solution pilots <clears throat> where where they were, have been using the reverse bending machines, which are incredibly expensive and they take up a huge amount of space. And a lot of people are questioning whether, whether, whether that is viable on, on, on a mass scale. So I think it's, it's just keep, keep, keep the cost as low as possible and let's provide the convenience to then get the buy-in from the consumer. Great. It's really interesting about the different trade-offs, isn't it? And I really like that. It's, it's almost like one size is not going to fit all. You need to make it flex, you know, to Absolutely, the... Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and Alvin, what about you? Because obviously you're looking at multiple drop-offs as well and convenience. You know, what do you see as the kind of secret to that return journey for your packaging? I think, um, so... We, our, our return system is very simple and it needs to be. Um, it's very much, you know, our app is very much a user-friendly uh, app that basically is, is map-based. Uh, you know, you you click on the return point that's near you on the map that you're going to or you're, you're at. It already knows what sort of carrier or, or drop-up point it is. So you get a, basically once you're near that point or have clicked uh, on, on the map, and you scan the, the packaging with your phone uh, with our mobile app, it's 
it's uh, it just gives you a QR code basically. So there's no label or anything like that. So you have a QR code that you present to um, say a Royal Mail a postal office or or a scan at the parcel locker that you're at um, or, or give to the DHL guy that, that shows up at your door. So uh, <laughs> the system is the same basically uh, regardless. So the user experience is very similar in terms of uh, in terms of establishing um, costs and set of costs. Mm, yeah, we sure. don't really have. I mean, you know, a, a consumer selects it in the in the checkout, and the, yeah, they pay a, a fee for for choosing more um, you, you know uh, environmentally friendly packaging, um, and and then get incentives on top uh, for making that choice. Um, but in terms of the set of costs for um, for the retailers, we don't mm. have a, a set of costs like that. We we simply um, we do ask them to make it a slight slightly bigger investment, hold a tiny bit of more more capital in mm. you know investing in, in in reusable packaging rather than cheaper single use. Um, mm. However, they tend to buy very big loads anyway of single use to get the price down, um, and because they're shipping from China or wherever they bought it, so. Um, it's not a huge ask, um, and in terms of integration, it's, it's very simple. Um, they do have some costs, but it, it, it will vary greatly. Mm, really interesting. So this is this, you know, they're barriers, but they're not. They're you know, the barriers that we can get over just by operating in a way that businesses already operate. You know, yeah, so I think like that's, that's coffee, crucial. You're, you're not creating a different system, or there's a queue different, or there's a you know, you're just going through the the, the regular system. Yeah, and 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 we asked. We actually started off with the postal service in Norway, just as an example, and and, and a few others as well. And the second we asked for them to to utilize their empty space in their in their vehicles, etc., and and take them back reverse logistics wise to us, it was a no right away because it added a step and it added educating nice. forty thousand employees and it added this and it added that. So so it, it it just there was no way. So we had to plug into what they're already doing and, and do it in a similar way and use their their the tech they're using and, and basically play their game. Um, but that being said, uh, you know the, the the biggest postal service in Norway uh, and Sweden and Denmark have, for example, have agreed to only cover their costs. Uh, so they're actually not making a profit by by uh, returning all of our uh, our packaging. So, um, so so th they're they're seeing this too as a, as a great opportunity marketing wise as well. And I'm sure we'll get back to that. Brilliant, great, uh, yeah, yeah. We haven't even touched on that. And I just um, wanted to touch on carbon came up earlier. So how where does reuse fit with these other sustainability challenges? You know, uh, carbon being a big one, but obviously there's other things like ethical production and end of you know end of life and things like that so can you give me a view on on where carbon sits with your re new reuse model so for us it's it's uh, quite simple so we we look to uh replace uh 100 parcels and uh and all void fillers that are potentially being used in, in each of those um so so that's sort of the the carbon footprint footprint we compare with one of our bags which has integrated integrated padding uh that's our goal um uh, even if we uh, land at uh 50 uh we're, we're still very clear of, of single use uh, carbon footprint comparisons still um and then obviously you subtract the uh journey and the washing that we do for each uh, each cycle um, mm. But then we can we have you have to compare that to uh, the entire life cycle of a single use product, which isn't only the the carbon footprint of producing it, it's also the shipping, uh, and it's uh, mm. you know, from China or or even Europe, um, and then it's um, obviously the end of life as well, which is either recycling or laying in a landfill and, and emitting um, gases there. So it's it's a big picture kind of uh, thing so we're working on a very thorough uh, lca right now um and it's it's important to get the numbers right even if even if it's hard when you don't have a lot of numbers yet um but it's mm. the the case is is very simple really i mean it's it's one product produced and shipped versus 100 versus, yeah subtracting of course some some uh, some yeah. transport but it's transport together with other items that are going to be transported anyway so um yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting when you put it like that. So, you know, going back to where we started with this waste hierarchy, it's all about reducing the number of items, right? And just keep the utilization is the same. So you still get 100 uses, you just don't need 100 items. Exactly. Um, and, and, and the same for Dan. And Dan, I know you're looking at carbon footprinting as well. So that's obviously 
pretty important to you that you get this balance right? Yeah, so it really depends on the product because we, uh, we're trialing uh, coffee cups as well as food and we'll shortly be doing pint cups as well. But in terms of the, the coffee cup, which is our best performing product, uh, the consumer only needs to use that three times compared to a standard disposable coffee cup and they will then be saving carbon. Mm. Or to put it another way, the carbon uh, that has gone into, the additional carbon that's gone into making a reusable cup mm. is, is recovered after just less than three uses, which, you know, which we think is a, is, a, is a fantastic selling point. And although carbon isn't that tangible, I think more and more people are becoming more aware of carbon and the importance that whatever system we do, um, you know, the, that, um, that it is, that it's a, um, that, that it's, um, you know, a carbon saving solution. So for example, if we produce this in a double walled stainless steel, it could take 50 or 60 uses to recover that, the carbon in in the, from the stainless steel mm. well if that item is lost out of the system before it recovers the carbon then you you've just got a carbon heavy solution so you might be solving a waste problem but you might be creating a carbon problem uh in, on, on the other hand that's yeah that's great and i think that's where we are now with all these models and systems is trying to you know, they may well have been devised around waste reduction or even plastic reduction. And then um, now we're sort of saying, oh, hang on, we've got net zero. You know, we need it to also be carbon reducing as well. So, yeah, it's got to you know, be a win-win. You guys really are taking it on. <laughs> all the big, all the big hitters, you know. I think we've just got time for one more question. And it's, it's a kind of a roundup one, I suppose. And it's, you know, we started here talking about reuse, but was you know i'd just love to hear from you both do you think reuse is the new recycling um and why alvin sorry put you on the spot that's right uh, i was expecting dad to to jump sorry. in on that one um so i i uh, for me it's a resounding yes um and it's it's based on on the markets that i'm seeing uh, interest from customers, um, businesses, retailers, uh, and consumers, even governments. Um, so the pressure from below and above right now, and also even the, the businesses, the commercial side, realizing now that they need to jump on this new opportunity. It's a commercial opportunity for uh, for brand new income streams um, and, and a market that's they recognize will explode, uh, and, and they need to grab a hold of. Once that commercial incentive is there and, and, and realized, I, I think it's, it's just a question of time now before before uh, it just completely takes over. Fabulous, thank you. And Dan, is reuse and new recycling? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think to answer the question, reuse needs to sit in the hierarchy above recycling but it needs to work with recycling so that, for example, if our cups get used 40 times uh, or whatever, then, then there is a mechanism so that, the, that that item is recycled at the end of its life. And, um, and, and, and you know, we don't just jump to reusable products that aren't recyclable. Um, it's got to be a win-win. Yeah, great. And Alvin, we didn't touch on you, but I'm I'm presuming the Packerang bag is fully recyclable at the end of life. Yeah, no, for us that's sort of uh, along the same uh, same lines. I think recycling shouldn't be forgotten about. It should be it should be a given. It should be an addition, and it should work with with reusable. Uh, and yeah, so it's fully recyclable. Yeah, great. Well, that's great. Well, we've we've spent an hour talking about reuse, which is my favorite topic. And um, you know, I can't thank you guys enough uh, for joining me today. It's been absolutely tons of questions. 
I don't know if we can we can maybe answer those offline, Sweeta, do you think? Um, if we can capture them anyway, we'll try to. But thank you to everybody for, you know, um, the audience, I mean, for being so engaged and so interested in the topic. Obviously, everyone's available online. I know for a fact we're all on LinkedIn. So um, if you have got any other uh, questions or indeed connections that you think can help accelerate these business models, then, uh, then please do get in touch. Sweeta, do you want to wrap up? Yes, thank you, Emma. Thank Thanks you, very much. Thank you, Alvin. And uh, like Emma mentioned, I mean, I've already dropped the links to both CanCan -Can and uh, Pakarang on the chat box, so you will be able to go see their websites there. And we will try to respond to the questions that have not been answered when we put up the webinar on the BBS Rise website, which will be in another couple of weeks. So thanks a lot to the audience as well as the panelists. Have a good day and a good evening wherever you're at. Bye-bye.